Okay, it's seven o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Writers' Workshop. Um, my name is Salim. I will be serving as your host tonight and will help navigate questions. Um, our topic tonight is Writing Your Memoir, um, presented by local author Param Parasturan. Before I introduce Param, um, I do want to give a few updates about the library. Uh, so we did expand our hours um, and are offering meeting and study rooms. Um, so be sure to check out our website um, for additional details at champagne.org. If you don't feel comfortable coming into the library just yet, that's okay. Uh, we are continuing our curbside delivery service. Um, this is where you can request items at home and pick them up in front of the library. Uh, for more information on that, please visit champagne.org slash curbside. If you need help and you have questions for staff, there are a few ways you can reach out to us. You can schedule a consultation at champagne.org slash book a librarian. You can chat with us anytime the library is open and you can email us at librarian at champagne.org. Um, I also wanna give some information um, about a new program. It is a campus and community focused collaboration titled Pandemics as a Portal to Change. Um, and it's presented by Cranard Art Museum. And what it is, is it's a public call for creativity, including writing, visual arts, original music and video. Um, and they're inviting the community to, to participate um, and to take one of our current struggles and imagine how we might make a change and reimagine our world. Um, I'm gonna share a link here in the chat um, and I'm sharing this here uh, in our writer's workshop because creative writing is one of the areas that they are seeking work in. Okay. I'd also like to share a few instructions for communicating through Zoom tonight. Um, so depending on your device at the bottom of the screen um, towards the center, you should see the option to chat, which will allow you to type your question in. Next to that um, is the raise hand option. This is if you prefer to use your microphone and I can unmute you. Um, Param will be answering questions throughout the presentation. So please feel free to use the chat or uh, raise your hand anytime you have a question. Okay, with that said, I'd like to now introduce our presenter. Param is an entrepreneur and author uh, with a passion for discussing mental health issues, issues in the business community. He chronicled his powerful story in his memoir, Perfect Pain, and he's here tonight to share some tips and techniques um, on what it takes to capture your story. Param, thank you so much for being here, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you for the intro, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, the last time I did, did this, it was, it was live, and I got to uh, see lots of pretty faces and uh, be able to uh, get uh, fairly instant feedback. Um, this one is a little bit more challenging speaking into a, uh, TV screen, but, uh, I'll do my best to, uh, hopefully, uh, answer some of your questions and, and hopefully make this productive and, and, and meet some of your goals. Um, I would tell you that generally when I, when I do these type of, uh, talks, I don't, I don't have anything rehearsed. Um, I just like to talk and, and, um, it's very important that you, if you have questions that you do them as, as we are talking, there's nothing that you could possibly interrupt. And, um, and obviously she's going to be monitoring your questions and, and uh, she'll interrupt when, um, whenever it, it's, uh, it makes sense to do that. But sometimes just asking questions going um, along the way helps kind of uh, move the conversation to where people really um, will, will benefit the most rather than just listening to me just uh, ramble on for uh, whatever number of uh, period of time that we're doing this. So I'll just get right into it. I thought the best way to start this is to tell you a little bit of background about the book. Um, um, and then I'll get into a little bit of why I wrote the book and obviously the intentions and then a little bit of the process. And and once again, I just tell you, please ask questions along the way. There's nothing um, that will bother me and interruptions are just fine. So um, I'll start in chronological or order, even though the book wasn't written in chronological order. Um, the book was sort of written in, an, in a style where it moved you to in a forward place and then went back and, and then and, and built up a little bit of context of why that was and it continued to do that throughout the book. And so the book is entirely um, back and forth from a, from a time standpoint. But I'll tell you a little bit about the story of, of my background to eventually what led to me wanting to write this book. So I was born in Iran. In 1971, I'm almost 50 years old now. In 1971, I was born in Iran. Um, I came here 
fairly shortly after I was born, roughly when I was one year old, I came to America. Um, as a one year old, I came to America and my parents, we moved to uh, Oklahoma City and where my dad was doing, did his undergrad engineering at the University of, uh, at Oklahoma State. So from the time I was roughly about one to about five, I was in America. Um, that's where I learned, you know, English. Um, I, I, I spoke bilingual at that time. Obviously, my parents were teaching me Farsi, which is the, the native language in Iran. And, and uh, but, you know, the, you know, I was here between one and five. I didn't, you know, that's a very young age. So memories are vague, but I obviously have some, you know, blanket, you know, feelings and memories about living in America. But for the most part, not that much. We went back by design to Iran when I was five. Um, and the intention was to, to be in Iran indefinitely. And the, really, the real reason my parents were here in America was just for my dad to, to get his education and go back to Iran. We went back to Iran uh, and my dad immediately started uh, building his career and, 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 and got off to a quite strong start in his career, was eventually running a, uh, a fairly good sized factory. And my dad was an engineer, so he was running a pretty good sized factory in uh, outside of a village of, uh, in, in, in Esfahan. And, and from my standpoint, life seemed, you know, fairly normal. That's just, you know, what it was. Um, for those of you who don't know a little bit of history in Iran. So during that time that we went back, uh, Iran was ruled under the, the Shah, the Shah of Iran, and it was a monarchy. And from the time I was five, six, fairly normal time that I became seven, um, things started to fairly, you know, change uh, and change fairly rapidly. Um, there was a lot of uh, unrest in Iran, and there were some factions building up. There was some division and 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 what people wanted out of Iran and what people did want out of Iran. And an opportunity presented itself um, that the uh, which was at that time Ayatollah Khomeini um, was able to gain some power, and there was a movement to for for Iran to change basically into what would eventually would be the Iranian revolution, which eventually turned into the, the Islamic the Republic of Iran, which is what, what you see today. Um, in, in an ordinary day, I was uh, living, like I said, outside of a major city, but we lived in a village. And the only reason we lived in this village, and we lived in a very nice house, had a pool, very nice, very nice, uh, very nice accommodations. And we were, you know, middle upper class type kind of uh, living and, and kind of, like I said, my dad was on a really good path, really good path um, from his career standpoint. Obviously, American educated um, had a big deal. Western education was, was very much... Uh, was very much uh, something that was uh, attractive at that time and, and what factories and businesses and, and Iran, the direction that it was going to. Fast forward a little bit, 1979, the, the revolution really started to take, to take hold and it got a little bit ugly. And to say a little bit ugly is, is kind of an understatement, but um, it, uh, you know, people in the streets uh, uh, protest, but the protests were, met with massive, massive, because, you know, you know, with a Shah with, was met with massive um, retaliation. And it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't a normal situation where people can just protest and, and freely do this thing. You know, people were being killed and jailed and, and uh, tortured and everything uh, that you can imagine. At the same time, one of the things I did not mention is that this was a uh, Islamic revolution and we were not Muslim. And basically, when the Shah got overthrown and Khomeini came into power in, in the late 79, um, everybody that wasn't Muslim, and especially people like ourselves that were Baha'i, were basically being um, were being tortured, they were being jailed, killed, um, but basically unaccepted. They were basic, you know, they, you know, accounts frozen, businesses frozen, businesses taken away from them, um, schools taken away from them, basically anything that they were doing their normal way of life got completely turned upside down during this revolution and obviously especially if you were not muslim at the time so on a we'll call it a wednesday i don't remember but roughly it was on a on a it was midweek i come home from school and i at this point i'm about nine years old and um my mom my dad is gone he had he had already fled iran just literally on a splits notice um because he had had uh We'll call it an assassination attempt on him. 
um, but a bunch of his uh, employees, thugs, whatever you want to call it, sort of raided his office and, and held him there. Um, he was able to be taken out of there by help of conversation and, and working his way through through it with them and also some bodyguards that he had at the time, which wasn't unusual to have uh, in the position that my dad had and basically taken out of this very strange environment and basically literally came home, got on an airplane and fled the United States and then worked with my mom to make arrangements to, to have us leave. So basically one day we're in Iran, going to school, normal day, and the next thing you know is we're packing up and, and we, need to, we need to get out of there. Um, while this was going on, a little bit of a backstory, um, from the time I was about eight, most of my eight, you know, most of the time that I was eight, um, I was also sexually abused by, uh, by an older cousin of mine, an 18 year old. And like I said, I was eight or nine years old at the time. And this sexual abuse lasted for about roughly about a year. So there was this underlying trouble already brewing in my internal life um, with, you know, personally with this, this abuse that I was uh, ashamed to tell my parents or, you know, anybody, which is why it continued to last. And the only reason it ended up stopping was because of the revolution and, and our basically desire to get the, the, get, get the heck out of there. So my dad leaves, my dad leaves the country. My mom makes arrangement. We literally pack up. I think I remember it was like eight or nine suitcases and we head to Tehran, which is the capital of Iran. And from there, we had arrangement to fly out of Tehran and eventually meet my father in London um, and eventually work our way to the U.S. and, and, and be granted political and, uh, and uh, political asylum. And while this was happening, as we get to Tehran and we're literally one day away from flying out, the Tehran airport gets bombed. And the reason it got bombed and destroyed where no flights can go out was because while all this was going on on top of everything iran and iraq were in a 10-year uh, war that was going on every single day of our lives um that that's all we ever heard about so the terror airport gets bombed my dad is gone my mom is and my brother my older brother and i eight luggages we are basically sort of stranded in tehran trying to figure out a way how to get out of here and meet my father my dad makes arrangements through his connections and people he knew and family and friends and you know um and long story short with 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 a crazy train ride in, in through the desert camel rides car rides walking about a two-day escape we eventually work our way out of iran and into karachi pakistan we get to karachi pakistan and after about a week or so there we were granted political asylum and we end up, and we end up back we end up back into the US um, and eventually land in California. We get to California now I'm in fourth grade. So this all happened from the time that I come home from school and my mom tells me that we're leaving um, Iran to the time that I was starting a different fourth grade class in California was roughly two weeks this whole this that whole entire period. So now out of nowhere I'm lost in, in starting a new life in, in, uh, in California um, at this time, because I've been in Iran and then I've done schooling in Iran. I, you know, I, I have, I know a little bit of English, you know, I, because of how I first started here, but, you know, I still have an accent, you know, and, and, and on top of it, the worst part about it is not just being an immigrant and being from Iran, is that the people that are old enough here in this audience that would know at the same exact time was the Iran hostage crisis. So, just to give you a little background on that, there was this 400 some plus days, I forget, where that the embassy, that the US embassy was raided um, during, this, during the revolution and, and hostages from that embassy were kept for over, I think, believe 400 days or something like that. And um, so that was a massive, massive um, political story that was going on. So when I came to America, um, being an Iranian was, uh, was not cool. Um, obviously, we were, we were hated in, in many ways because um, the Iranians were ho holding uh, Americans hostage and had been doing it for over a year. We were taught to not tell people we were, you know, from Iran. We would use the word we were, you know, we were Persian. Um, that sounded better, and people didn't really know what Persian meant, so we would use the word Persian, and and we used did not use we just did not tell people that we were from Iran. So start there in fourth grade. We're uh, living in, in California for roughly three, four months. 
teacher comes to me one day in the middle of the class and says, hey, kids, uh, Parm is moving to Chicago. And, you know, my parents didn't even tell me we were doing this. You know, I had like maybe one day's notice before we were told that we were leaving uh, Iran, barely no notice, and all of a sudden, you know, land in California, move into Joliet. Move to Joliet, and I'll forward a little bit here to tell, you know, to not get too much in the details right now. But um, from the time I was in fourth grade to my freshman year, in, in high school, which I eventually landed in Champaign and I went to Champaign Central, I had moved 11 different times. And throughout this time, inside me, you know, I um, was dealing with not just all the, all the chaos and the craziness, the, the amount of people I saw killed and my family members tortured in Iran and, the, and you know, the, watching the protests and, and all this other stuff, that the 11 times moving, um, the biggest story really was that at the same time, I wasn't really connected with my parents and my parents, obviously, for many reasons, one culturally, the other part is that they're also dealing with just trying to figure out a way to put food on the table. And so the last thing they could do was tend to my emotional needs and maybe even explain to me what the heck is going on. And so I was kind of left alone to my own devices and trying to figure out and, um, and not ask too many questions of my parents and out of fear of, you know, being upset about it. Um, and, 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 and I, and I knew that this was a very difficult time, but at the same time, I kept everything to myself. So this is, you know, all of this, we'll call it childhood. I don't like the word trauma, but we'll say childhood injuries. Um, we're starting to aggregate and starting to build up. Um, but most important, the fact that I really didn't have this great relationship with my parents and a communication process that what, you know, what, you know, what might be normal. So freshman year, I finally, after 11 moves, end up in Champaign and I end up staying here. And, and during this entire time, what I had to learn how to do because of all the moves was I had to learn how to fit in. And so I became really, really good at adapting and I became really good at figuring out how to make people like me and whatever, whatever I could do to make people like me, I did. Um, I don't care what it was. I would um, literally whore myself out and, and make let, allow people to make fun of me and to, to get a laugh or whatever needed to whatever I needed to do I did um, to get to became you know to, to be able to fit in okay and so finally find some semblance of normality when I land in Champagne and we're now here actually for a consistent period of time and at that point you know after this many years and this many moves I started mastering the art of um, sort of marketing myself, personally marketing myself to be able to find friends and to be able to feel fit in and to be able to find love, all the wrong love, but be able to find love. And, and because I didn't really feel it for my parents, um, the continuous moves did not allow me to really have great connections with, with my friends. And so in Champaign, I kind of like, you know, willed myself to become really popular and, and do things that soothed myself. And what I did was I got really good at sports. And I got really good at becoming popular. And this wasn't done consciously, somewhat consciously, but a lot of it unconsciously in a way to find happiness, to at least find some peace or, or to be able to really just, or um, to be able to sort of soothe myself. And so I did all the right things. I made friends with all the right people. I, you know, was almost like orchestrated um, somewhat manipulative in a way in some ways of just trying to orchestrate friendships and you know between how I was um, arranging who I was dealing with or, or playing sports and calculating what sports I played that were popular or not for example I became the quarterback of my uh, high school team because the quarterback was very popular and the quarterback tended to be you know the most liked player on the team the quarterback was sort of important so I learned to become a quarterback and I played quarterback in high school and then I played tennis and I went to state and, and my high school career started becoming, it started working. It started working at least in the short run where I was starting to feel good about myself. And I was popular. I was playing sports. Um, by the time I was a senior at high school, I was my homecoming king. I was prom king. And I was voted most popular. And I only tell you these things because it was part of a plan to find a way to make myself feel better. Because underneath all of this, and we'll get to this, I had a massive depression. And so on the surface, if you were to look at me when I was a senior in high school and as I'm going to college, you would have said, wow, this guy's, re you know, he's really got it going on. You know, he's really got it going on. And, 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 and what I created was, was, was these forces around myself 
um, to continue to distract me from the underlying depression, the sadness, and the, the lack of real connection that I had with my parents. And I just distracted myself with all these very superficial sort of tasks and act or, you know, um, go to college. Uh, I do real poorly because now I go from, from Champaign Central High School where I was extremely popular, everybody knew me. Now I'm at a University of Illinois with 30 some thousand people. Um, I even joined a fraternity, but it still wasn't the same because I was no longer the Parham the King in high school. And so my bubble started slowly bursting. You know, the bubble that I kept juiced up to, 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 to ward off all the depression and ward off all the real injuries that I had started to like deflate. And it was the first time I started getting into a little bit of drugs. I started, you know, doing marijuana. Um, next thing you know, I'm doing psycholytic, psych, uh, psycholytic drugs like mushrooms and acid. And, and, and I drank a lot. I get kicked out of the University of Illinois, work my way back into the University of Illinois, eventually graduate. And at this time, I was, um, was able, we, we were very poor still th throughout this time. And so I had to put myself through college. I worked as a tennis pro. Um, luckily, the, the tennis sort of uh, helped, me, helped me from a financial standpoint um, be able to get work my way through college. And so I paid for my entire college and I worked. And, uh, and then as college started nearing the end, I started trying to figure out what I wanted to do for, with the rest of my life. I knew I didn't really want to work for anybody. I wasn't good at doing that kind of thing. And I knew I wanted to be in business. So I took about $70,000 that I had saved and built up um, as a nest egg during college because tennis teaching and being a pro was fairly lucrative. And I took that and I invested into the, the first business I did. Don't want to get into the crazy amount of the business part, but I was able to take the same things that I did before, learning how to become popular and applying it to marketing in the sense in business. And I was in the retail tire and automotive business. So the same way that I made myself personally popular, I used those same tricks and I made my business popular and little by little, started gaining success. And even then the success and what I was trying to accomplish was all fake. It was all for the wrong reasons. And as a result, even though I was growing really fast, I was building my company really fast, it wasn't really built with any strategic strategy in mind or any, any real thought. It was just what sounds the best, what sounds the coolest, and what sounded the best was for me to have lots of stores. So I started with one store, then I had two stores, two stores didn't seem good enough, then I needed three stores, three stores didn't seem good enough. And I remember at one point, I always used to think that if I had three stores, that would be amazing. And I got three stores, and that didn't feel good anymore, so I needed four stores. And it was not much different than, than how I viewed drugs or any type of material sensation that I would bring to my life it was just, again... I needed something higher and something higher and something higher. And I had to keep, you know, I had to keep doing it. So then I went from 10 stores and, and, but it all blew up the first time. And, and I had 10 stores when I was 26 years old and I lost almost everything. And I went back down to three stores, went to grad school, slowly build, built things back up again. And, and at the same time that this was happening and, the, the little bit of the, the, the winning and doing well and the self-destructive behavior started getting really bad. The drugs started turning from marijuana and drinking and things to cocaine. And then once cocaine came into my life, um, it became all-encompassing. And then I went through a very long period with a massive cocaine addiction that started at using cocaine, you know, once or twice a week to, to spending three or $400 a week. And Next thing you know, I'm married even, and my business appears to be thriving, but it wasn't because I had a lot of stores, but it didn't mean I was doing good. Everything was on a house of cards. I just had built up this sort of house of cards. And next thing you know, I'm doing about $2,000 a week of, of cocaine, spending roughly 80, 70, 80, $90,000 a year on cocaine. <clears throat> and the way that I was using cocaine wasn't social. It wasn't you know, going out to a bar and meeting people and, and, and using drugs and, and partying and having fun. I was disappearing for three days at a time, locking myself in a hotel room, locking myself in a bathroom. I would literally go into a bathroom in my house, lock the doors, bolt everything up, and I would be in that bathroom for almost two days sometimes um, with a bunch of cocaine, a bunch of alcohol, and I would just literally sit in that room for two days and some days basically just wishing I would die in many ways tried to do enough to make sure I did die and did not happen. But 
I did this sort of false parum all over Champagne. You know, I was getting business loans. I'd go to one place and, you know, people like, oh my God, you're doing so great in business. You got eight, nine stores. And then I lived this other life where I was locking myself up or I'd pretend I'm going on a business meeting in St. Louis and I'd spend three days in a hotel and not come out of that room. Um, just completely messed up out of my mind um, with, with just massive, massive amounts of drugs, which I don't know how I survived, but I did. Um, but I was living this like double life and, and then I was even married and, uh, even had a kid. Um, and I was still able to hide this thing because I just kind of became a master at, at, at orchestrating this appearance and this, what I wanted people to see. And, and, you know, I could go and hide out and, and go on a bench for three days and disappear, but then I could come back out of that and then work for four or five straight and kind of get my business you know, half-ass right and, you know, get things, you know, sort of on track, but then I'd go right back. And anyway, this thing just went on and on and on. And I'm kind of going through the, you know, the brief version of this, <clears throat> but this thing kind of went on and on and on, but it was getting to a point that I was basically, my wife found out I was going to lose my marriage. I was going to lose my children. I was basically going to lose everything. Um, and then came an intervention, we'll call it. My friends started really getting concerned. My wife, obviously very concerned. I have a child. And I knew, I knew I was living this just horrible, horrible existence and something wasn't right. Um, but I, would able, I was able to juggle enough where I could still justify, hey, I'm still doing okay. Hey, I'm still doing okay because I, you know, it, it, I'm not dead yet. And, you know, I still have a business and I haven't lost everything. But, but I was literally on the verge of not just losing my business. I was losing my marriage. I was losing my children. And it was nearing bottoms of all bottoms. I decided not because I wanted to, because I was sort of forced to by my family and friends to start seeking therapy. I meet a doctor, a psycho, psycho, a psych, he's a psychiatrist with the, you know, they specialize in uh, psychoanalysis. And I had seen therapists in the past. And of course, people would say like, you can go to AA, you can go to Hazelwood, Hazleton or whatever that's called and do these 30 days, you know, programs. And, at, and while this sounds crazy, um, while I was leading this insane life, that was just, just insane. Um, I still, if I wanted to get fixed, I knew it wasn't going to help me by going to some, uh, some rehab for 30 days because I knew the problems were deeper and I kind of knew these problems were deeper. And, and, you know, surface level sort of treatment wasn't going to really solve the real problem, but yet I was resistant, but eventually I did. So I start seeing a guy, his real name is Dr. Jekyll, believe it or not, amazing, amazing, amazing physician. And so I started going to see Dr. Jekyll and just fast forward a second, you know, this Friday when I go see him, I, and I go there every single week, sometimes twice a week. Um, I've been doing it, it will be the 18th year I've been doing this. So I get engaged in psychoanalysis and what psychoanalysis did for me and what I, what it, what it did was after much, you know, it took two, three years for it to really start to make sense for me and really start really, really benefiting me and, and getting somewhere. But basically, ultimately what, what was going on was psychoanalysis was a way for me to go back to my childhood, my, my seven-year-old self, my eight-year-old self, my nine-year-old self. And sort of little by little, unpeel, you know, peel that onion and really get to the core of my issues as opposed to just saying, I'm never going to drink again, or I'm never going to do drugs again. It's like, why are you doing the drugs? Why do you need to be popular? Why do you need to make so much money? Why do you care so much what people think? It really went to the core of the whys that, that I got myself into this place to begin with, because I eventually realized after a few years of therapy that. I wasn't a drug addict. I wasn't an alcoholic. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't this narcissistic person that all I cared about money. All of those things just helped satisfy and ultimately ward off and push away all my internal pain that I, that I had, that it's been unresolved and sort of suppressed. So psychoanalysis sort of unwound those kinds of things little by little, but it doesn't work where someone can just tell you this. It's a process. It's a very slow process because you can only listen and understand and be taught what you're able and capable to capable of learning and understanding at that time. And so many years into the therapy, little stuff started happening. I started getting a little better, but I was still using drugs. I still have binges, but it was getting a little bit less, but at, at but I, I was definitely into the analysis and I was definitely starting to understand why this was helping me. So I don't know, we'll call it 10 years into 10, 10 years in the therapy. I started really feeling pretty good. I started really feeling pretty good. And 
and it wasn't, you know, it's not something that happens overnight, but it was one day, basically, I was feeling to, to such a point that I felt like I need to, to write about this and write about this for many reasons. One is, is, is partly selfish. Sometimes you write memoirs and sometimes you write this thing because they're cathartic. In my case, I was so passionate about the type of therapy I was doing and really going to the core of my problems rather than, like I said, just going to a 30 day rehab and, you know, willing yourself that I'm not going to drink anymore because that doesn't really last. And, and, and what I was starting to find was a lasting reason of, of why I had these problems and really getting to the core of it and really getting to the core of it was understanding your pain was understanding your pain, and then more importantly, mourning all those things, mourning the child abuse that I had, mourning the fact that my parents and I weren't very close and I never had any real love. My parents never told me, my dad never told me he loved me until like 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, mourning all these things was what was necessary for me to really heal at a very deeper core level. And the more you can, you know, that I was healing at a very core level, the more I didn't need all these things. The, the more, you know, I didn't need to make money to make myself feel good. If I wanted to make money, that's okay. But it was going to be for different reasons and not to make myself feel good or soothe myself or ward off the pains or the, you know, the, the, the childhood injuries that I had. So I decided that I wanted to write this book. And in fact, before I even wrote one sentence in this book, I wrote down the title. And the title is, is, is called Perfect Pain. And why, why it was called Perfect Pain was because I had a moment or, or a period of time where I absolutely was grateful that I had all of these issues. I was grateful that I was abused as a child. I was grateful that I had parental challenges. I was grateful that I was a refugee. I was grateful that I was an immigrant that came from the U.S., during a very, uh, from the Iran during to the US from a very, in a very critical time. I was grateful that, um, that I had all these challenges with drugs. I was, I was just absolutely grateful for all this because had I not had those things, I wouldn't have been in therapy and I wouldn't have really done the big, big work of really trying to figure out who I was, why I was and why I was doing all these things. And so perfect pain, what it meant to me and what the book is all about at the end of the day, while it's a memoir, there's, a, there's an important message that's, that's sort of the underlying belly of this book. And is that I truly feel grateful that the amount of pain I had was acceptable for me. In fact, I'm glad it was because that's who I am. Um, and that pain is, is what drove me in, in some ways to do positive things drove me to have therapy. It, it got me to all of these other things that I did where I look around now in my house and my, my career and my business has been, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled about everything. I have three wonderful children. I have a great marriage. And, and I, had I not had all these things, maybe I don't have therapy. Maybe I don't do all these things. And I wouldn't trade any of this for anything. I would not want to go back and trade one bit of challenge that I had throughout my life. And so I wanted to write a book to not only tell the story, but more importantly, to tell people that challenges are part of life, um, but finding truth in yourself and, and, and why and how these things play out in your life and what those challenges do in your in, 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 in modern day time. So, for example, a nine year old injury that you have, unless it's resolved or you've really worked on it, continues to play out when you're 30 and 40 and 50. And if you don't resolve it, and really figure it out then it will inhibit you for the rest of your life un, 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 unchecked, right? And the other part was I was a male. I was sexually abused by a male, um, frowned upon. People don't like to talk about it. Um, the uh, uh, people don't like to talk about psychology. Uh, uh, and I'll say again, males especially, because it's a sign of weakness. And so what I wanted to tell in this story, in this book, to, the, to everybody was that that it is not a weakness to go seek help. Um, that in fact, it's a strength if you can go through that process because I challenge anybody to go through psychoanalysis for 18 years and really deal with the worst pains that you can possibly imagine. But every time you confront those things and work through those, you just get a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger and a little bit stronger, right? So truth to be told is most people are afraid to do those kind of things. So it's a sign of strength when you can, you know, to go through that process. And, and especially being a male, um, 
talk about psychology, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to see a shrink, you know, there, there's just sort of this sort of stigma with it, as if, you know, the, like I said, the weakness that it, that it portrays, especially with amongst men. And so I want to tell the story as a strong man that was very comfortable talking to anybody about being sexually abused by a male. I'm talking about anybody that said that I was a weak, weak, insecure human being um, growing up as a child, insecure, 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 insecure. I had tons of insecurities, um, but I worked through those insecurities and I met my true self and I will continue to meet my true self. And because it doesn't ever end, you know, the, the, the process never ends. And that's really why I wrote the book. Um, and it's been met very well. Um, I have some just incredible stories of people that have read the book and, and secretly some of them and anonymously, sometimes people will write me and tell me how important this book was for them because they've had depression and they've had psychological issues and they've had all these things, but they're afraid to tell anybody because, you know, they would be again, looked at as weak. Um, and, and I was trying to basically give you a, a reason to not feel that this is weak. So I think I've talked enough for a little bit at this point. Um, I want to make sure I'll stop for a second, see if there's any questions right now um, or where we want to we go from here. Yes, please feel free to type in the chat or raise your hand and I can unmute you. We'll give it a second and see if a question comes through. Oh, I do have a hand raised. Uh, Shivani, I'm going to unmute you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi. Uh, it was so wonderful to listen to you. Uh, and I think like the way you were describing your memories, uh, it made a lot of sense to me because I am... I am an, in art education and I'm also talking about trauma and pain and I live with disability myself. So <laughs> I am going through, uh, I mean, I I'm also going to a psychiatrist. So yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm like almost in the same process right now, I feel. And I think I, I, I can articulate it much better while I was like listening to you. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, of course, of course. Okay, a couple of questions came through the chat. Um, the first one says, thank you for sharing your beautiful story. Um, there are so many beautiful heartfelt threads. I wondered, how did you decide which thread to focus on in the memoir process? So the memoir process, what I really wanted to do, the entire book is, is written in a way that ultimately I wanted to tell the story of the process of the therapy. So in order to do that, I had to put the reader in a, in, a, in a setting so they could really go through the trauma with me. And so, for example, the book starts out with a horrific scene, okay? And then it goes to backwards in time when, for example, when I was a freshman, yeah, when I was a freshman in high school, I was living in Gurney, I was playing football, and my mom on a Friday comes to me without any warning and says, Make sure you come home right after school, after football game, because in the morning we're moving to Champaign. So here I just made all these friends. I'm the quarterback of my team and I have all this, you know, good things going on. And literally my mom completely disregards that I'm a human being, doesn't give me any warning and says, tomorrow morning, pack your stuff and we're leaving to another city. So I try to take the reader to these very sort of dramatic scenes. OK, and so that I can paint the picture that you can see, like, these weren't ordinary, these weren't ordinary things. And like I said, they're not incredibly, they're, I don't like to use the word extraordinary pains. And, you know, some people read my book and they're just like, oh my God, I can't believe all this stuff happened to you. You know, I don't think of it that way. I just think there's, there's people that have so much more challenges, um, but there were certainly challenges as a child. But so I, so I wrote it in, in describing in my chapters of things that you would understand as later on, I bring in the psychology of the book into it, and I bring the psychotherapy into it, and ultimately describe in this book for, for maybe more than half of it, the psychological breakthroughs I was making. But I had to tell stories, 
And so the book isn't a book about stories. So I was giving you the background, but if you read the book, there are stories in there. And sometimes people have asked me, I wish there was more stories. The idea wasn't for me to tell you stories about my life. I was telling enough stories that, so I can then explain to you and you can understand why I had such depression, why I had such anxiety and why I had all these things. So then I can describe the process that I will take the readers through my therapy and this, the evolution of my psychological mind, which is ultimately the evolution of me gaining strength and my self-esteem improving. Did I, 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 hopefully that answered your question. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what was your writing routine like for a book length project? <laughs> Um, um, so this is an emotional book. Um, hopefully some of you will read it and, you know, I've heard people will cry through the book. People will laugh through the book, but it was an emotional, it was an emotional process. So anytime you're writing a, a memoir, like I said, this wasn't just telling stories. I was ultimately reliving a lot of these things in the way I very descriptively write some of this stuff. You know, when I write about my abuse and things, I, you know, I, it's fairly descriptive. Um, so you're kind of reliving some of these things. So it was very, very emotional. So the way I wrote was I would, I would, I almost had the entire book in my head before I even wrote one sentence. I literally had the chapter set up, the process and the, and the sort of the cadence of how I wanted to go back and forth already in my head, never even on a piece of paper. But then, so I would write chapter one. Okay. And I pretty much ended up with the chapters being almost in the same order that they ended up being. Um, only a little bit got changed once I brought in editors and then, you know, I had a team of people that, that, that also then sort of and were part of the end process, but really nothing got changed. It was still really the first way that I thought of it in my head. But the process basically was, I would think, 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 I think, you know, I could not write for four days. I could not write for five days. And then I would sit down and write an entire chapter um, over a two day period and sometimes not sleep and stay up night and whatever, but I would just write it, write an entire chapter in, in continuation. After I wrote the first few chapters, and at that point, then I got picked up by a, by, a, by a publishing company, and then the publishing company, then I had an editor, and so then what I would do, and she would try to encourage me to have a little bit more of a pattern, and you know, I was supposed to like turn in the chapter every week, sometimes it would take me three weeks to turn in the chapter, sometimes I would turn in three chapters in one week. So there was no pattern to it because of the emotional part of it. And it was a feel thing for me. If I didn't feel it, I couldn't write. Again, because I wasn't telling a story, if I was just telling a story in chronological order, I could just sit down and write, okay, in 1979, this happened, da, 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 da. but that's kind of boring to me. Like that's, you know, I wanted to take the reader on a ride. And, and that's how people describe the book. Like, you don't know where this is going. There's no beginning. There's no middle. There's a, it's, it's, you're, you're kind of on a little bit of a ride. And because of that, it became a little more difficult to write and, and involved emotion. And so I had to feel it. And so when I felt it, I wrote it. Sometimes I'd go to Chicago and I, uh, I, had a, I have a place in Chicago and I'd go to my apartment in Chicago and I'd be there for three days and I'd come home and I'd just written like a beautiful chapter or, you know, a couple of great chapters and, and that would be it. And then I might not write for two weeks, but that was basically how I did it. Thank you. Um, another person is asking, how do you handle discussing real people who treated you poorly or worse, i.e. abuse, in your memoir? Um, so there, there's only a couple people that, so obviously you have the person that abused you, and then I had challenged my parents. I'll do the easiest one, which is my, um, with my parents. So the way I described and talk about my parents and my brother who didn't treat me that great is that it wasn't their fault. They just didn't know any better. They, they, they loved me in their own best way that they could. They didn't know how to give me what I wanted. I was a sensitive, creative kid. And they obviously were dealing with, you know, I had to go back and really understand that, listen, you know, they, they had, a, they had a, some bad things handed to them as well. My parents out of nowhere all of a sudden are doing great in their career. Imagine you're, everything's going good. And like right now, and all of a sudden I got to move to China or I got to move to India or I got to move to Peru. Um, to live, you know, so I know that, so that's difficult. So I, what I always used, it was the word malice and basically intended that what all this stuff that happened to me was not malicious regarding my parents, my brother and all the other negative things. When it comes to the abuse part, I wasn't so kind. Um, you'll have to read the book and I you can see how I described it, but um, the, the last paragraph, I 
describe what I would like to do to that person. Um, but at the end of the day, I sort of forgive everybody because at the end of the day, again, I'm grateful for that because had the abuse not happened, you know, I'm not, I'm not here talking to you guys, maybe, you know, and I'm not a, the strong person that I am because of the, 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 how lucky I was to be able to go find therapy that I really enjoyed and really thrived on. So I, I'm very careful to put everything on myself, meaning I don't blame anybody. And, and I wouldn't write a book called Perfect Pain if, if I didn't enjoy the pain in the sense that um, at the end of the day, I create how I think and how I feel and do those things. And so I don't blame anybody. So I, I was very gracious with how I um, describe people. Thank you. Um, and the next question you kind of um, already touched on, but they're asking what made you decide to write in a non-chronological order? Yeah, I did describe it. Uh, I think chronological order is boring. Um, um, I'm a, I, I feel like I'm a little bit more creative. I think um, in chronological order, okay, let me, let me back up. It, it might fit certain stories. I wanted to write a book that not only told the message, but I really wanted to take the reader onto a mysterious ride where you would, you would see the beginning. Like I start with me, my, I start the opening scene where I'm locked in the bathroom, um, high as can be, paranoid and, um, and, 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 and coked out of my mind, okay? And I want the reader to read that first paragraph or that first, that, that first intro and be like, what the heck? Like, how's this? And then the next chapter is talking about how popular I was in high school and, and on these kinds of things. And they're like, what is going on? Like, how's this popular? And basically moving them through the thing and eventually start, things start coming together. And so um, that's why I did it. I, uh, um, and, and outside of that, I don't know why I did it. It, it, just, it, just felt, it just felt the most interesting to me is to take the, the reader on a little bit of a ride as well. But, but, but not a chronological ride and going forward, going backwards. Thank you. And so the next question is asking, how long did it take to complete your book? And at what point did you employ an editor? Okay, so the, um, so I wrote, I wrote the uh, first 24, 40 pages, I think. This is it 24 or 40 pages? And I, uh, I met a writer, his actually name is Dave Ellis. He, he's actually, uh, he was doing a seminar and he, he was a friend of a friend randomly I met. And he actually writes, he writes fiction with, with James Patterson. You guys have probably heard of James Patterson. So you'll see some books with him that will say James Patterson and Dave Ellis. Um, he was randomly doing a talk and I met him and, I, and my friend and I said, hey, would you read my first 24 pages? And so he read my first 20 pages and gave me a couple of notes. But at the end of the day said, hey, this is really intriguing. Like he was like, I like this character. Like I want, I want to know more. And so the 24, first 24 kind of got him. So I kept writing and maybe I got to like 40 pages, a couple of chapters in. And then I went to a seminar in New York, uh, a writing seminar in New York. And at that time they had editors, you know, people from all the big publishers. There it was like a three-day seminar. And I was uh, in, uh, there was this ghostwriter there. Uh, her name was Kelsey, wonderful girl. And she uh, was a ghostwriter, not an editor, but she was a ghostwriter. And so I was talking with her at, at, at lunch one day and I was telling her about my book and uh, she, I was telling her about my story, what my book idea was and whatever. She's like, wow, I'm really intrigued. And I said, would you read it? And, I, and she said, yes, I'd love to read it. And remember, she's a ghostwriter. So a ghostwriter is one that you tell them a story, you talk to them, but they basically write your book. And I, didn't, I wasn't looking for a ghostwriter, but she reads my book and she's intrigued. And I said, do you like it? She's like, yes, I do. And I said, do you want to be my editor? And she was a freelance. And, and she said, I would love to. And, 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 uh, and I'm saying, but I was like, but I'm writing the book. She's like, no, 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 you have to write the book because this is your story. Like, like I'm going to do. And so her and I hooked up. She was a freelance editor. She was a freelance editor. And so we hooked up and, you know, that process then took maybe a year and a half, two years, almost, believe it or not, it took a long time. And basically, that's where I was basically, I would write a chapter, I would send it to her, and she would edit it. And she was amazing, because she really wanted to keep it authentic. And she would hardly change things. But maybe, you know, she would help me like structure things maybe a little bit differently, or give me some tips or change some things. But for the most part, let me speak in the same way I'm talking to you right now. And if you read my book, you will list, it'll feel like I'm talking to you right now. It'll feel like this exact same sort of cadence. And so she was really great about that. So, the, so that was about a two year process. And then once the once her and I finished, then I 
we went to a publisher, gave it to a publisher. Actually, it was one of the publishers that was at that New York, uh, at that New York uh, conference. And I reached out to him and said, hey, my book is done. Would you uh, mind reading it? And so uh, I'm not a funny story on its own, but basically they read it. He read it, the owner and the, you know, the hate publisher anyway, he read it. Um, calls me one day and says, hey, I, I'm in. We, we'd like to do this. And so, um, and that's what I went. And then once that happened, that's a heck of a process as well, because now, even though I had edited it, I wrote it, it's fairly complete. When the publisher takes over, then they bring in what's called a, uh, um, oh, shoot. Uh, I'll tell you in a second. Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. But basically, it's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, editor that really gets into the weeds and is like grammar and like every little detail. And so they, they bring that. They bring somebody to do the cover. They bring a third editor that, 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 that does a different process. So there's about four people that then touch that book between the cover. Somebody else does the inside cover. Somebody does the outside cover. So there's a little bit of process. That took, um, uh, that took a minimum six months, maybe close to nine months for that process by the time we finished that part of it. So there was a little bit of process. There's much faster ways to do it, depending on what. And the, the hardest part was I was sort of a perfectionist. I, I had a hard time putting it down. I kept wanting to tweak it. And, you know, my editor was like, no, 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 don't, don't, don't mess with it. You can, you know, that's like a, like people that draw paintings and stuff. They constantly want to tweak it and stuff. And there's a point you just have to stop, but it took about four years um, to, to write the book. Thank and, you. And, and you kind of answered the, the next question. Um, their question was, what was your process for getting signed with a publishing company? So thank you for elaborating on that. Um, so I'll go to the next one after that, um, which is, with the chapters being so emotionally charged, I wonder if you had any sort of self-care or aftercare routine following writing uh, an emotionally draining slash charged chapter. Um, I would uh, had no problem having a couple of glasses of scotch. And, you know, one of the things that might seem odd to you guys is, you know, a, a guy who was a massive drug addict and, 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 and all that is that one of the beautiful things about being what I loved about psychoanalysis and what, and which was exactly the type of therapy that I did not want to have, which is like, you can never ever drink again, or you can never ever do drugs again. See, none of those things mattered anymore. Like I can have drinks. I can even do drugs. I can do, not that I do, but it, it won't like spin me off and send me into a, you know, fall off the wagon kind of thing, because at the, at the core, I'm very much fixed. So yeah, absolutely. I would have a glass of scotch, a glass of wine. Um, sometimes I would have wine in, in certain times I would have wine and put music on that, that would take me back in time, you know, to my childhood days. And some of my best writing came, um, to be honest with you, when I had a couple of glasses of wine and, and, and nice music in the background. And, and a lot of crying, a lot of crying. Thank you. While we wait in, uh, for any additional questions, I do want to read one nice comment. Um, someone said, I love writing and I'm also a therapist. So hearing your story has been such a gift to me. Thank you again. Yeah. And, you know, writing was, it, it was very therapeutic as well. It was very therapeutic as well. While at the end of the day, I wanted my story to be, not because I wanted for people to have my story so they can say, oh, way to go, Parham. Um, I really believe people need it. And, and, and from the comments, um, and the letters that I received once the book got published and the people that reached out to me, I knew this was a hidden thing that, that, that people don't want to talk about a lot. They don't want to talk about their psychological problems and they don't want to talk about their weaknesses. And, and when this stuff started really coming out and, you know, like I said, people literally were handwriting letters to me, um, then I knew it was the right thing. But at the end of the day, um, to, to, to whom that, that was the therapist and, and, and mentioned that, had not one person read the book and not one letter been done, my, um, my win happened by completing the book. Because it's one thing to think about a book um, and it's one thing to finish a book. And that was an advice I got very early on from that Davis Ellis that I told you when I wrote that first 24 pages. And, and one of the pieces of things that he wrote when he critiqued my first 24 pages, he just told me, he goes, you need to finish this. And I was like, of course. But he's like, no, you're not listening. You need to finish the book. And, and I'm like, of course I'm going to finish it. He's like, no. Everybody says they're going to finish a book. Everybody says they're going to write a book. Everybody says they're going to do a memoir. But 99% don't finish the book. And that stayed with me forever. And the fact that I went through that process from beginning to end, wrote the book, completed, had an actual last chapter, put it in, you know, on a cover, put it on a shelf, or an Amazon, I should say, 
um, was enough satisfaction and it brought enough joy and therapeutic sort of, uh, what's, yeah, but, I mean, cathartic is one thing, but, but, but it, it, it provided enough, not just to my self-esteem, but to the, my general self-concept of how I viewed myself is that I actually did something from beginning in that, again, had one, not one person read the book and not one person um, benefited from the book. I was complete at that time and everything from then on was just icing on the cake. Thank you. Uh, another attendee said, uh, your book is uh, a reality for many people. So we appreciate it. Yeah, I, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I feel the same way. Um, um, I don't mean this selfishly. I, I truly feel the same way. And I, and I said that earlier and I, and I might sound like I'm repeating myself, but I'm so passionate about is that, that again, the comments and letters and things that came was people saying, thank you for saying this. And my question always was like, man, is there just a whole world out there that is afraid to, 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 to talk about this type of stuff? Is there a whole world out there that is, you know, that we're, that we're afraid to talk about our insecurities and, and, and we want to push those away and, 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 and busy ourselves with distractions and, and, and not really meet the real core um, um, things that we've suppressed in our life and the real core injuries that we've had. And, and uh, so, yes, the, uh, it, it really, I realized the more people I talked about, I would do seminars and I would go do talks and stuff, you know, and the more I could just see in people's eyes and sometimes in their tears that like, wow, this really resonated with me. And I knew it would because I'm a regular guy. I'm not like an author, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a celebrity or a famous person or like an incredibly successful person. Um, I'm just like everybody else to telling, telling the story. And I think that's what it really resonated because we all have a story like this. A lot of us have a story like this. Thank you. Um, and um, one more question came through, and I think we'll make this the last question of the night. Um, they are asking, can you talk about how you worked through the sequence, writing and rewriting to get the right tone and right rhythm, and how you drew all the threads together to end it? Mm. Well, this is going to sound surprising, but I didn't really have to think about it that much. Um, stuff would just kind of come to me. When I was ready to write, it just kind of came. I could start a chapter, okay? And I always knew how a chapter was gonna end. So basically every chapter has a sort of conclusion, we'll call it, or, a, or an aha or a, or, a, um, or a message, okay? So every chapter and by the titles, I, every title was already pre-done in my head also, but everyone had already sort of an ending. And so the whole thing was building up that, that chapter and how that, 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 that first paragraph starts, but always intending that I knew how that chapter was going to end. And then amongst that, on a bigger picture, I always knew how the book was going to end. The, the last two chapters are called Perfect Pain 1 and Perfect Pain 2. And I already knew what the whole point of those two chapters was going to be. So it was very easy because I sort of had it all there and all I was doing was sort of working backwards to build up to this conclusion. So I already knew the conclusion of the book and I already knew the conclusion of each chapter. And so the rest was just getting to that. And, and that's the part that I said, like if I didn't feel it, I wouldn't write. But when I wrote, I knew how it was gonna play out because I would just I would just write it. I did go back and edit. So basically I would do this. I would write the chapter or the pages or whatever I wrote very quickly. So I might write, a, you know, the other thing I did is the book is, I don't know, 30, 40 chapters, but all the chapters, some chapters are five pages, some chapters are 10. They weren't, and that was by design. I didn't, I didn't want these long ass chapters. I just wanted a very short, brief, get to the point, tell a nice little story that, that builds up to that. Um, so when I would write this chapter, I would write that chapter very quickly. And then I would go to bed. And then the next day, I would look at that chapter again and then I would refine it and I would refine it and I would refine it. So that might've taken me two or more, three more times of refining it before I would send it to the editor. And then the editor, my editor also was great. So then, you know, she'd have a little input to it, but uh, like I said, she kind of left me to be, um, but basically it was write it quickly. So my advice is don't get bogged down on details when you're writing a, when you're writing a chapter or writing a book, write the stupid thing and go back, 
Write, go back, write, go back. But don't sit there and try to make this paragraph perfect, next paragraph perfect. You just need to write, okay? And then you need to sit on it and maybe come back a day later, two days later, three days later, and then it'll start all working its way through. But never feel like you need to finish a chapter or a paragraph and move forward. Yes, and so, someone said, uh, so happy to hear that someone else writes in their head and then as I call it, uh, brain dumps when the thoughts are ready to be put on actual page. Thank you for an insightful evening. You're welcome. Okay, I don't see any more questions coming through. Um, so uh, we are nearing the end of our workshop. Before we close out, um, I do wanna give a reminder for next week. Uh, so the ne uh, program next week will be Poems from Prompts with local poet Jim O'Brien. So April 7th at 7 p.m. Um, so be sure to register for that one. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I want to give a big thank you to Param. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, we will see you at the next workshop, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you to you as well. Bye-bye.